can we chicken out from the responsibility of managing poultry in a very heterogeneously developed region of the world? And I'm, I guess this is quite common throughout the global south, but I am well versed with the situation in South Asia and from that perspective, I would try to talk about how we need to develop unique perspectives about maintaining poultry in a system where we also have wild birds. So our friends who have worked on envirobacters or different sets of pathogens associated with poultry or people who have been working on the whole idea of domestication of chicken and spread of different varieties across the world have discussed about the roots of this expansion in South Asia or Southeast Asia. And we have with us Professor Maiden Dawkins, who discusses extensively in context of animal welfare, and it includes chicken welfare as well. But somehow, from my limited experience, I can share that in this part of the world, we cannot tease apart chicken welfare and human welfare from each other. So in Western countries, animal husbandry practices have achieved a certain success in context of putting animal husbandry practices out of the main city center. And we all have certain protocols which people who are agriculturists, they need to practice it. And in such context, the potential cases or consequences of disease spillage are controlled in many forms in context of the spatial ecologies which could affect us. And the way things are monitored are somehow well controlled in a scenario where you have a clear gradient of where people are housing animals or rearing animals and how these supply chains are supposed to reach the point of consumption, which is our city centers where we have markets. So such kind of rules and regulations about keeping and rearing chicken or different animals is there. It's a common place in context of how the government plans things in this part of the world. But for hundreds of years, we have been doing animal husbandry practices in a very informal fashion. So if our friends here are not well aware, then animal husbandry practices are quite an insurance scheme for the urban poor as well as the rural poor. So both these sections, they suffer from a lot of economic stochasticities. And in such context, it is very important to understand how these minute practices of informal animal keeping gets, because, so gets accumulated within the markets and do we have repercussions on human health, animal health and in the new perspective where we kind of club the three major consequences and concerns of health which is like human health, animal health and environment, environmental health under the, the body of one health. So the first slide here depicts that urban informal settlement is precisely formed out of rural native source populations. And if you see this part of the slide where you have commensals and people doing animal husbandry practices in their backyards. So such kind of people have their cultural connotations about how they associate with commensals and how they take interest in keeping poultry, which allows them to have certain insurance in context of food, or which also allows them to do, indulge into certain economic activities in context of whatever they can manage in their backyard. So when such people move into the cities, which is what we understand as urbanization, you have, You must have observed them either directly if you're from the global south or you must have seen them in many videos where such kind of informal settlements are associated with huge piles of waste and then of course they have animal husbandry practices and these animals which are 
collectively called livestock are interacting day to day with a whole score of commensals. The trouble comes when you have these local associations interacting with migratory birds. And a paper in the journal ENAS, published by Professor Richard Koch in 2014, discussed or summarized that the major threat of one health consequences or zoonotic consequences in Asia and South Asia is likely to come from the interaction of migratory birds with the resident birds and primarily migratory birds which interact with poultry. So the further slides would illustrate this aspect. So this is a Google Earth screenshot where you can see three major species of red, uh, sorry, three major species of jungle fowl which are distributed in the Indian subcontinent. The top one is red jungle fowl, this one is grey jungle fowl, and down below we have Ceylon or Sri Lankan jungle fowl. So this broken line is roughly dividing the range of red jungle fowl and grey jungle fowl in South Asia. And I would make a specific connotation in context of how poultry, which is reared in the state of Andhra Pradesh. So this street, which I am outlining with my mouse cursor, is called Andhra Pradesh. And this state is the largest poultry producer. And because of the economic channels available in context of per decade increase in consumption of bird meat and eggs, a lot of poultry gets transported from this center to multiple centers across India. So not just the adult birds, but birds which people keep in their backyards. And at times even chicks, which are sent across the Indian subcontinent to start or to seed farming practices in small towns and villages. So I knew of this because in my childhood I had I spent about five years in this part of India where the residential school used to get its meat and egg from this same state itself. So why is this transport of poultry a concern in context of chicken welfare and in context of conservation of these wild varieties? So we just saw the multiple species of jungle fowl found in South Asia. Out here on our screen, we have multiple desi or local chicken breeds. So people who consume poultry have placed a higher price value on these birds. They cost about 300 rupees a kilo or 400 rupees a kilo, which is roughly about four pounds a kilo. And the birds which are in generally the broiler breeds, they cost something about 1.5 pounds or 2 pounds a kilo. So there is like just the price just doubles if you have a desi chicken breed. So these breeds are somehow in the way in between from right, when we have performed enough of genetic engineering to obtain our bro broiler varieties. And when we have jungle fowl, these local breeds are somewhere in between in context of how hundreds of years of rearing these animals in the backyard have allowed people to domesticate these birds. So in context of the gene pool, which is available in, in terms of these breeds, which are, which differ, Quite, they differ quite a bit from one part of India to another part, allows us to illustrate the component of domestication and why this continuum from wild varieties to the domestic varieties, which are from animal husbandry practices in informal setup, and of course the broiler varieties, which are coming from very local setup, needs to be seen in one proper continuum. So, this is how they typically look, and this picture is it illustrates how the local 
domestic breeds are housed together with the broiler breeds. And of course, these breeds cost higher and their maintenance and the area under which they occupy the marketplaces are quite large. These birds, of course, are quite cramped, which can be illustrated from the picture itself. So subsequently, the picture here illustrates how a common marketplace looks like in a South Asian setup. So the cage here, which you can see, is what is housing the broiler varieties. So it's not visible here, but generally they are cramped. About eight to ten birds are cramped in this, quite cramped in this cage here. And then you have these backyard reared varieties, which are sold for about four pounds a kilo, put out in open so that people can come and choose. The person here is, has held two birds in his hand, and it is quite common in townships and cities to find people carrying chicken in their hands, and they of course slaughter this bird in the backyards. So I'm illustrating these practices in context of how you will find links in context of these multiple chicken varieties and people who are well accustomed with how these chicken varieties might be moving different set of pathogens or microbes which are using these vectors as hosts. So the next slide here illustrates how minute supplies from small villages where people use bicycles and they tie up eight to ten birds and wherein you can see people tying these birds on their backs it eventually reaches the local marketplace so this is a common scenario under which you see a housing of a bird in most of the cities and towns and as much as delhi so the setup of how you find broiler varieties and chicken the desi chicken varieties on sale is pretty much similar i Yes, you can well relate with the consequences of this bird, which is a desi variety, dropping here. And then, of course, the subsequent levels are also perforated. So this, of course, allows birds which are down below to be affected by the excreta. And we can all continue to think about the consequences of what it might be leading to in context of spread of pathogens and in context of how it would affect chicken welfare. So, as I was illustrating in the beginning of this talk, in this part of the world, the idea of human welfare and chicken welfare cannot be teased apart. So, you cannot expect chickens or animals to have a decent life unless you also secure the lives of the human beings. And in the context of sampling of potential spread of diseases, I guess we are already suffering with one zoonotic virus and in context of innumerable species of bacteria which are requiring antimicrobial resistance. The whole paraphernalia of sequestering minute supplies from villages and small townships into large markets needs to be tracked in a similar fashion. One thing which needs to be mentioned here again is the social economic connotations or socio-cultural connotations of who is associated with a certain practice. So, of course, unlike most part of the world in India, we have caste systems. People are divided into certain castes and these things are kind of sub-categories beyond the religious demarcations, which is quite common in the rest of the world. So, the people from lower castes are the ones who are associated with transport of poultry and maintenance of poultry in certain aspects. And of course, the people who slaughter chicken, they largely come from the Muslim community. So in context of how specific community are interacting while transporting certain chicken varieties or breeds and how these multiple breeds are again going to interact with certain set of people who have a very spatially demarcated location of where they reside within a town or in a very large mega city would have a huge cascade effects in context of how a disease might jump from one part to another and how we might need to factor these things 
while we are trying to understand the spread of antimicrobial resistance or similar aspects of having improved animal husbandry practices in the global south. So the picture on screen here now depicts the largest You cannot read the text here. I'm sorry about that. So this is Gazipo chicken facility on the eastern border of the mega city of Delhi. And you can read here 86, which means that there are 100 such, close to 100 such shops. And from about 4,500 square kilometer, chickens are kind of sourced from these small villages and townships. And they are sold in different sections depending upon what specific variety or breed somebody wants to procure. And these are the trucks which generally transport these chickens from these smaller townships to a very centralized larger market. And then after these chickens are sold here from one township, they are again supplied to a larger chain of consumers, either in terms of processed meat or in terms of whole birds which are transported from one section of the city to another. So this was just a background in context of why few friends from Oxford Zoology Department and I are thinking to collaborate on the idea of understanding animal husbandry practices in context of poultry keeping and why the Wildlife Institute of India's campus and related areas allow us an enormous, uh, they extend us an enormous opportunity to understand the consequences of having wild birds and these domestic poultry or backyard reared poultry residing side by side. So I think it is pretty well clear from the screen here that you can see the 40 acre area of the Wildlife Institute of India campus. This was instituted in 1992 and it was a degraded forest then. So after 1992, so it has taken about, about 30, 28, 30 years and the forest patch here has resurrected. We have a good presence of red jungle fowl here and I shared a few pictures and a video in the material which was circulated with the Chicken Journal Group. And then you can see a forest patch out here, which is again invaginated by human establishment. And then you can see another forest patch. So after showing three, four slides, I would take you to the Google Earth imagery to understand the context of how this, these fragmentations of forest patches and interactions of humans, poultry, which is being reared in the backyard, and the wild birds into the wildlife systems need a collective focus to understand the consequence of a sustainable system wherein we can have, we can extend conservation support to the red jungle fowl populations within these small forest patches. We, and we can have a safe poultry keeping in these units or smaller villages where people readily keep these poultry birds in the backyards. So if you understand, shift your focus from Wildlife Institute of India campus quite nearby and within 10 kilometers itself there is Asarodi forest range office where you can see that the human establishment is invaginating again into a forest patch and this is the second point this is the second location where we would be sampling the aspects of interactions of these chicken breeds with the jungle fowl and human establishment on the habitat matrix effect. So I'm sorry for sounding so jargonish, but I will try and explain it in context of the Google Earth imagery towards the end of this talk. This is quite near to the Institute, Wildlife Institute of India, and it is within 60 kilometers from the Institute. And you can see that the two large blocks of forest are disturbed or they have been fragmented by a township and this is a major concern for 
movement of animal species from this part of the forest, which is relatively richer and which is in contiguum to a larger forest patch in the Terai Park belt along the Himalayan range. And of course, this township here does not allow enough animals to move from this part to another. So I guess this would set the thought process ringing in the people who deal with genomics in context of how animals hopping from one end to another and how these chicken nets in the habitat features would be important for wildlife conservation, particularly in context of bridging and fowl. The third block within the same district would come from Forest Research Institute. I'm sorry that you can not see, read it again. So Forest Research Institute, unlike Wildlife Institute of India, was instituted in 1906. So we have spent about 100 years, and in these 100 years, you can see how human establishments have propped up on this side, while the whole really large forest patch of about 80 acres has remained intact. And this, this forest patch is quite rich, as rich as the nearby forest patches from the forest ranges or protected areas near the township of Dehradun. So this was the last slide in context of how I'm trying to distribute my effort in context of sampling these poultry breeds along with the red jungle fowl. And the last slide here depicts the collective idea of how they are spatially distributed in the face of Terai R. So Terai is the foothill and is in the foothill it is in the foothill of Himalayas. So these are Himalayan ranges and above, these areas are above like 3,000, 3,500 meters. And before I talk about this slide, I would like to take you to the Google Earth imagery. Can you all see the Google Earth imagery now and how, when I zoom in or zoom out? Yep. Okay. So if you relate with the second slide, which was part of this presentation, we can well understand that the whole development of human establishment in the Terai Arc Belt, which has been a very rich foothold of different animal species, or which is quite biodiverse, has been impacted. So thankfully, Google Earth allows us to see a bit of history, of course, not a lot into the history, but we can go roughly two decades. And I would like to illustrate that aspect in context of why Red Jungle Fowl would call Wildlife Institute of India's campus a home. So as you can see that this is a contiguous forest patch and it runs along the Himalayan belt and it is of course broken by multiple townships. So if I zoom in on the Wildlife Institute of India for a patch, and if I take you to the history of it, then we have the Google Earth imagery from 2002. So all number of, the number of houses or the, the person built up area has definitely increased. Of course, the fragmentation was already there, but in context of how the habitat quality of Patch quality itself impacts migration from, of animals from this part to another part and back would be the focus. I say so because if I move through the time, you can see that there is gradual increase in the built up space here. And considering that we have a very negative impact on multiple wild species, you do not expect these birds to come from this continuous forest patch to the intervening small patch, forest patch in between Wildlife Institute of India and this continuous forest patch. And of course, a subsequent jump from this forest patch to another one. I guess we, if you're familiar with the literature on ecology and how forest fragmentation or habitat fragmentation this allows certain species or allows certain species to utilize these forest patches or fragmentations 
it is well established that with progressive four to five years, you can see that the density of housing has increased in the intervening areas, which would potentially stop the gene flow from multiple blocks. And this is not a unique phenomenon in and around wildlife Institute of India patch. It is something common for all over India, wherever these different populations of wild red jungle fowl are distributed. It is quite common in the Indo-Gangetic belt because this part of the world has possibly the highest density of people residing. And of course, most of these people are below poverty line, which is quite well associated with the practices of animal husbandry. So if I move to current time frame, we can see how well human establishment has encroached the space here between. And of course, this is something which would continue. More blocks would be sold and progressively least amount of gene flow would be here, would be available. So I'll get back to what I was discussing earlier. And this is just a synopsis of what the pilot project would do in context of relating broiler and desi varieties and the jungle fowl species. So the project would, of course, start in the state of Uttarakhand, which is in the Himalaya, which is right in the middle of Himalayan ranges and in the district of Dehradun, which is a valley in between two, two mountain ranges. One is Shivaliks and the other is Himalayas. So I say broiler because of the increased production of meat into the city centers. Many people are opening farms in their backyards. The people who are residing in the villages have a lot of space and economic opportunities to indulge into it. So in context of quantifying the population ecology, which includes the habitat matrix effects, I would sample habitat patches by laying study plots, which would halfway lie into this forest research institute's forest, and half of it would lie outside it. So once you sample animals in this fashion, and when you potentially take tissue samples from the birds out here and the birds which are residing here, you would be able to compare the distinctions of how well there is a potential of genetic fusion. And of course, when we talk of genetic fusion in between two different subspecies of birds, you would understand that they are potential vectors to so many different varieties of pathogens which are associated with these vectors. And once we crack down a large continuum of population into smaller themes because of urbanization and similar impacts, you would have certain threats associated with potential mixing or hybridization in between the desi varieties and the jungle fowl. So I would also collect tissue samples in the pilot project for genomic analysis and pathogen screening to see how well they are overlapping in these two systems. The third component of the project would have a basic focus on behavioral ecology to understand the habitat matrix effects in the context of certain populations or restricted populations of red jungle fowl which showcase specific or quite differentiated flight initiation distance in context of fear to humans and anti-predatory responses. So this whole idea would come down to support assortative or disassortative mating systems in between the desi varieties or the local varieties of chicken and the jungle fowl populations which are demarcated into certain pockets in and around the forest ranges or at times in the middle of the city as well. So once you have assortative or disassortative mating systems, so from literature on mating systems, we would understand that the males would be thrown out of the natural territories and they would need to move out, which is quite common in bio
biological kingdoms and which also translates into disassociative networks which are formed. But in context of how these two varieties are interacting, we might have associative networks in context of how these small jungle fowl populations into certain city pockets and how these Desi varieties react similarly to human presence. So the whole idea of how different populations of wild birds and how well accustomed Desi varieties to human presence might form associative units and how these settle within themselves. So Desi varieties would potentially find resources in context of potential mates within the red jungle fowl. Red jungle fowl individuals, on the other hand, are found frequenting human backyards for foraging opportunities. And of course, they've also been noticed mating with the Desi varieties. So this is something in a nutshell. And this whole discussion brings the connotation of movement of poultry from smaller units in smaller towns like Dehradun and likewise to much larger towns where a lot of chickens, about 100,000 chickens are slaughtered in an area like Gazipur landfill. So this is not a COVID time pic. This is a picture from another research project which I do on black kites. And this landfill is a place where chicken remains from chicken slaughter are consumed by migratory black kite species which come from Central Asia. So the whole idea of conundrum of interaction of waste of chicken processing needs to be taken into account in context of how these chicken varieties, broiler varieties and desi varieties are being sourced from smaller population. How they are supposedly reaching a common marketplace, how certain aspects of chicken slaughter by a certain group of people would expose or would predispose a certain section in human society to certain set of pathogens. And these would, of course, be applicable on local to continental scales in context of the birds which interact not only with the chicken base, but also with the waterfowl, which are migrating using the similar routes from Central Asia to South Asia. So I'm sorry if I bored you guys with scales moving from local levels to something from, of course, Central Asia to South Asia, but somehow the scalar associations of things happening in our backyards and has affected us currently in context of the global lockdown, which is still under practice and which has crippled the world in multiple ways for the past six months. So COVID is just one example and we, many diseases and pathogens of this kind might be overlooking. And we have about 10,000 of these migratory kites hovering on these landfills, moving from one part of the city to another. An important, an important aspect in context of these congregations, the landfills, is this association of chicken slaughter in the Gazipal chicken facility, which is right next to this landfill. So till 2018 of September, we observed chicken slaughter or slaughter of about 10, 100,000 birds, which used to happen in that market itself. And then we had people who wanted, to, who wanted the market force or the, the private setup to practice animal welfare within their market circuits. And they filed a public interest litigation in Delhi's High Court, which led to a ban of slaughter in the market adjacent to this landfill. So suddenly you did not have the foraging opportunity available to these wild birds, which are coming from Central Asia. And we have about 20 of these birds tagged with GPS transmitters. And we could notice that in context of reduction in the amount of forage which was available for them on this landfill allowed them to distribute throughout the city. And of course, it was something similar for the chicken slaughtering practices as well, because the people who were getting jobs in that market, which was a collective unit for 1,500 square kilometers of Delhi, 
was redistributed throughout Delhi as well. So when we discuss the movement of pathogens or the simple idea of how antimicrobial resistance can be acquired or transmitted, these minute happenings in our backyard should definitely be recorded. Um, in this context, I have convened a research network which is for people, animal, and waste systems. So in future, I can talk about that. And we, this group is meeting tomorrow to have discussions around the possibilities of interacting human and animal systems right from the, within the forest to the edge of the forest to the human establishments. And our discussions would involve history of townships, the whole idea of domestication and why domestication also needs to be studied on a real-time basis because these animal units which are residing with humans are showing real-time changes as well. The whole idea of social economics of generation and disposal of solid waste would supposedly impact the human-animal interfaces and ecology and evolution of infectious diseases. So if our friends are interested in something like this. They can contact me privately and I will stop here. Thanking Chicken Journal Club for the opportunity. And I would thank all my colleagues because I'm just a video of the enormous support I get from the Black Eyed Research Group and other research groups within Wildlife Institute and Oxford University's Wallace Department. So, Happy to take questions.